Welcome to the series of Logos in the Muse, a journey in mythical history from an Orthodox Christian perspective. This is now Lecture 9. The last few weeks we've been discussing the medieval synthesis, and we briefly touched on the basis for the allegorical use of gods in medieval literature. This week we will stand looking up at the nearly insurmountable mountain that is Dante, with the hope that our climb or Anabasis will be successful. Before getting to Dante, we need to back up a little bit and talk about Virgil. Virgil, born Publius Virgilius Maro, lived in 70 to 19 BC during the famous Augustan age. He is considered one of the greatest poets of the ancient world, second only to Homer. And in the West, since they didn't have access to Homer for a while, he was considered above all writers. The Aeneid, which was used to help teach students how to read and write, was integral to much ancient and medieval education. Virgil wrote mostly poems centered on agrarian life until he was commissioned to write the that would become the late, right? The, would become the later the great national epic of the Romans. So it's quite evident that Virgil is indebted to Homer, but he did not try to mimic Homer's style, which would have been inappropriate for the Latin language. Latin had to be formed to fit poetic verse, and Cicero did the same thing for oratory. Following. Homer's dactylic hexameter wouldn't have worked. Virgil had to tweak it a little bit so he could write in the same meter, which is the meter of the heroic epics. The Aeneid follows many of the patterns as the Odyssey. And some harkens back, especially see in the opening of the Iliad. Now, however, Virgil was the most original of the Roman poets. He did not plagiarize Homer but he was greatly influenced by Homer. So there are two clear influences that Virgil had on early medieval poets. One, as we saw last week, allegory was used mostly as a scriptural hermeneutic. Later, this methodology was turned to the pagan poets. And Virgil was the most read and interpreted. And the second influence was that the form, it was a form of poetry called cento, which was basically a remix of poetry. So poets would like to take lines from another poet and reorder them and create different poems and different readings. It's very similar to today's homage that is sometimes done in films. Um, Tarantino was the famous for borrowing scenes from filmmakers that inspired him. So these poets were similar. They would borrow lines from other poets, restructure, reorder them, create new poems. So furthermore, Virgil was considered to, by many in the Middle Ages to be a proto-Christian because of the virtues, this idea of pietas, of duty, devotion, were so central to the Aeneid. And specifically also for this fourth eclogue, which is believed to be a prophecy of the coming of Christ, which I read in the earlier lectures, but I will read from again. <clears throat> I quote, Now has come the last age of Chimean song. The great line of the centuries begins anew. Now the virgin returns. The reign of Saturn returns. Now a new generation descends from, high, from heaven on high. Only do you, pure who seen him, smile on the birth of the child, under whom the iron brood shall at least cease a golden race spring up throughout the world. Your own Apollo is now king. So reading this in terms of a coming Messiah, Virgil is elevated to the status of prophet in the hearts and minds of medieval Christians. In Purgatorio, Canto 22, the poet Statius tells Virgil that he became a Christian because of him. I quote, And he, to him, you were the first to send me to drink within Parnassus' caves, and you the first who after God enlightened me. He did as he who goes by night and carries the lamp behind him. He is of no help to his own self, but teaches those who follow. When you declare the ages are renewed, justice and man's first time on earth return, from heaven a new, new progeny descends. Though you 
Through you, I was a poet, and through you, a Christian. So Virgil held a very special place in the ranks of Western poets. With this very high opinion of Virgil, it should be as no surprise that Dante places him in the Divine Comedy to be his guide. Dante was an unusual poet for his time. He was not a clergy, which many poets were clergy. Not only did he have a fascination with poetry in general, but he had a deep respect for all ancient pagan poets, not just Virgil. He was well educated with the scholastic, within the scholastic school and well versed in history. So Dante was also innovative for likely being the first to write himself into the story from a first person perspective ahead of modern literature by centuries. The preeminent scholar on Virgil and Dante, Domenico Camporetti, says this I quote, his, his learning, Dante, his learning is eminently scholastic, and the goal of his thoughts is the discovery of truth by means of the philosophical theological speculation. And this medieval tendency accompanies him in his contemplation of antiquity. He is, hence, familiar with allegory, and his mind is so prone to it that he even allegorizes himself, while in his poetry, his philosophical and theological ideas present themselves to him in the forms of images and symbols which constitute no small part of the complicated fabric of his creation. So what Virgil did for Latin and poetry, Dante did for Christian poetry in a lay language, which was Italian. Latin was a language of the church. So no other medieval poet was able to accomplish what Dante did, nor was there anyone who showed such a mastery of ancient poetry. What he did was truly remarkable. I said in the last lecture, the medieval synthesis was his all-encompassing idea. It included things as cosmology and astronomy, and music and biology. And even though we were not discussing all of those aspects of the synthesis, but know that Dante encompasses all of this within his divine comedy. We see... The cosmology, the, the philosophy, the science, the theology, and the mysticism all playing an integral role and all presented with this musicality par excellence. Even though he respected the early poets, Virgil was Dante's favorite author and the greatest with whom he was familiar with. He also revered and admired him for his promulgating the glories of Italy. In the Aeneid, specifically, Dante interpreted the journey of Aeneas as a model for the progress of the soul toward perfection. Now, he was not the first to do this, or others before him who wrote about this idea. But Dante himself found that it mirrored his own journey. So this idea of the soul's movement is found in antiquity. The fullest expression of this mythological idea is our own St. Maximus the Confessor. The soul must remove from its origin, which is its, the, its creation, and then return to its source, its telos, which is God himself. And we see this idea of being, well-being, and eternal well-being in Maximus the Confessor. So Whereas Dante would take a more Thomist approach, which is not altogether incongruent with St. Maximus, but Aquinas develops this idea further into conceptions of essence and existence, potentiality, and actuality. In a much more systematic, a rational, Aristotelian way than we find within our own tradition. So I digress, though. I'm going to get back to Virgil. So according to Camporetti, he says this, in the construction of his great poem, Dante de derived the main idea and many of the details from Virgil and made a more use of him than any other writer in the course of his work. So the takeaway from all this is that Dante choosing Virgil as his guide wasn't arbitrary. So is there an orthodox reading of the Divine Comedy? Well, first, we had to ask the question, what is the Divine Comedy? If you've not read the Divine Comedy, this, mm, go read it and come back. 
just hit pause and then come back <laughs> after you read all that and then come back. <laughs> But most people have a basic idea of what the Divine Comedy is. They know of the Inferno. That's a very common part of it. But the Divine Comedy is Dante's magnum opus. It is an epic or well, long narrative poem. It is truly the crowning achievement of medieval literature. And one of the best examples of the medieval synthesis. This is why we're discussing it. So Dante himself is the central character in the narrative. He finds himself lost in the woods. And it's not just merely being lost. There is something existential about it. It's something spiritual. It's the state of his soul. And he meets Virgil, who leads him on a long journey that begins with the descent, with the catabasis, if you remember from Lecture 5, the descent into the underworld. So this is the famous first of the three parts of the Divine Comedy, the Inferno. So in hell, Dante meets all kinds of people from mythology, heretics, and we see familiar places from the mythological past. And he even sees people he knows from back home. So in this way, Dante follows a similar pattern as Virgil. From the Aeneas visits the underworld where he meets his descendants, Dante here meets those from his own life. So as he travels downward through all nine circles, the sins become more and more severe, and those suffering become less and less human. It is the opposite of theosis. It's a demonosis. At the center, he sees Satan eternally devouring the three worst transgressors, the betrayers of Christ and Caesar, Judas, Brutus, and Cassius. So they emerge out of hell on Easter, They then come to the base of the mountain of Purgatory, and this is the second part of the Divine Comedy, Purgatorio. And here, at the bottom of the base of the mountain, they meet the late repentant and excommunicated. As they climb up the mountain, they meet those who have to go through this time of purgation, because after they they are baptized and practicing believers, but they just held on to certain sins that left them uncleansed. You know, at the top of the mountain of purgatory is the Garden of Eden, the earthly paradise. Now here Beatrice takes over for Virgil. And she leads him on a journey into the heavenly spheres. And this is the third and final part of Paradiso. And Virgil can be understood as reason. So eventually reason has its limit. And Beatrice, or Beatrice, as also some people pronounce, as faith, the personification of faith, has to take over. The only reason can take you so far. The ascent takes Dante through the nine spheres and beyond the primum mobile to the rose of paradise. So here we see hell is an inversion of the earthly realm, I mean, the heavenly realm. The nine circles and the nine spheres would have a focal point. So hell, you see Satan devouring the worst of sinners. He is the focal point of of hell, at the bottom of the nine circles. In heaven, it is sort of the, we see the rose in bloom, the rose of paradise. And beyond that, the Holy Trinity, where the saints who have achieved the highest dwell near the imperium, will dwell near God's ineffable, effulgent presence. So the nine spheres and then the focal point where the Trinity is. And in hell, the three faces of Satan, the unholy Trinity. So Dante's poetic vision of the cosmos and simultaneously his his soul's journey, just like the soul's progress read allegorically in the Aeneid, from the lowest point of the underworld to the uppermost place that is really no place in space and time as we comprehend it, where God's love moves all things. Throughout the first two parts of this journey, Virgil is Dante's guide. Virgil represents the idea of the handmaid of philosophy, with the purgative role of secular literature, which we read about from St. Clement of Alexandria in the first week. Only when Dante was about to ascend into the heavens did he need one of the saints to lead him. So how should an Orthodox Christian read the Divine Comedy? To read this wonderful literature, we need the proper lens. 
So the first and foremost, one must understand that Dante was influenced by scholasticism, which is a medieval school of theology and philosophy. Now, our theology is orthodox, do not, does not employ the scholastic method. This is where we come at odds with Dante. We do not insist that philosophy and natural theology is the foundation. The reason that this is at odds with our, with our tradition is because we believe that all true theology begins with prayer and revelation, not exercises in philosophy. In most Western theology, one will study metaphysics, epistemology, and things, the arguments for God's existence, and all these things before the revelation, the incarnation, the Holy Trinity. One will learn of things like act and potency, the cosmological and ontological arguments for God's existence, essence and existence, Aristotle's four causes, so on and so forth. That forms the basis a medieval theology. You have to want all the philosophical stuff first. That is at our odds with our tradition. We do not approach things the scholastic method. For us, theology is about, or the theologian is one who prays. The second thing is that we should read the Divine Comedy as a journey in salvation. So Dante sees the direct consequences of the damned, an eternity of suffering, and that suffering is based on the sin that landed them there. So many people are morbidly curious, so they have a fascination with the Inferno, and they never read past it. Dante includes much hope in his story, but if you stop in the ninth circle of hell, you don't get to see it. So we should hold the Inferno up to ourselves as a mirror. We should see that all ugliness in our passions is contained within that first part of the epic. In the Orthodox tradition, we have the oft-quoted phrase from St. Siloan, keep thy mind in hell and despair not. So if we apply this framing, as we read the Inferno, it will help us from losing ourselves in the bleakness and unmitigated suffering. So the full context of St. Siloan's quote should be kept in mind. Most people have heard that one quote, but they don't know the context. So St. Siloan had felt bereft of God's presence for years. So during one of his night vigils, he went to bow down to an icon, and when it was revealed to him that a demon was standing between him and the icon, he almost bowed down to the demon. So distraught that he couldn't even pray and make prostrations without being tormented by the demons, he had this revelation. The demons always afflict the proud. You must keep your mind in hell and despair not. So St. Siloan had to humble himself to the lowest point where the demons could not go since they cannot practice humility. He had to descend to hell. In Dante's hell, the demons torment the damned. We believe that we are tormented by the demons here and now because of our passions. We must acquire humble-mindedness in order to be free of them. If we recall from last week, we saw the demons that tempt us have, have not been sent to hell yet, and from what we learned from St. Silwin, they won't follow us there because they will not humble themselves. So our theosis should begin with this practice, the practice of humility and the remembrance of death. Then we must ascend. We all have to go through this process of purification. It is the first phase of our salvation. We need to cleanse ourselves now before we die. The purification process is an ascent. We see this in the latter of divine ascent, in St. Gregory's The Life of Moses. Essentially, these are based on Jacob's ladder, which we see in Genesis 28. <clears throat> and the toll houses also reflect this ascent, where you need to have been purified from each of the passions along the way to continue the ascent. Now, these concepts from our own tradition do not map perfectly onto Dante's mountain of purgatory. That's not a claim I'm trying to make. But the basic pattern of the purgative, this purgative climb, this purgative anabasis, works for all of these, though. At the top, we arrive at the earthly paradise, Eden. In Purgatorio, Dante makes the connection between Mount Tabor, being the mountain of God at the time of Christ's transfiguration, and the mountain of Purgatory. 
So uh, transfiguration, we would say that as Orthodox, that they experienced the uncreated light, and Dante, being a scholastic, would disagree. But nonetheless, he draws the conclusion about Mount Tabor. And the, and the ascent that the apostles had to do to re arrive at the top is the same pattern, the same as the one on the mountain of purgatory. And I quote, as to see some blossoms of the apple tree, which makes the angels hungry for the fruit and makes a perpetual marriage feast in heaven. Peter and John and James were led to the mountain and fell upon their faces, and at the word by which deep or sleeps had been broken came to themselves and saw the company diminished by the departure of Moses and Elias and the raiment of the master change. So I came to myself and standing over me, that compassionate woman who had gone with me when I was walking beside the river earlier. So many of the fathers, St. Isaac the Syrian, St. Justin Popovich, who also was commenting on St. Isaac, and also Metropolitan Herotheos as well, teach us of the three stages of theosis. And as we shall see, these follow the same overall pattern of the divine comedy. You have the unnatural, the natural, and for lack of a better word, the supernatural. So we are in an unnatural state due to our noose being darkened. We are therefore disordered, and we are ruled by our passions. It is a sort of hell. Through the process of purification, we will arrive at our natural state. This is the state of Adam and Eve, were in before the fall. And this idea you see all the way back to St. Irenaeus. This is the natural virtuous state of man, where, where his noose has been illumined and his mind is active in the heart. This is paradise. This is Eden. This is atop the mountain. But there's only one place to go from there, upward to the heavens. This is the third and final stage, deification. And the third way, or third thing we keep in mind while reading this, was that to read the comedy, you can also understand it as how reality truly is. Reality, or the cosmos, is structured as we see it in the divine comedy. Then now the minutia, the, you know, the places and the people and some of the names of the details are not necessarily to be understood as such, the very structure of reality can it follows the same pattern. What I mean by this is that paradise is understood as a mountain. And we see this in scripture, and we see this in St. Ephraim the Syrian, and St. Gregory of Nyssa, who also wrote about this. So read the life of Moses, and the commentaries on Genesis, and the hymns of paradise from St. Ephraim, and you'll see this. This is why the Tower of Babel, is an attempt at recreating paradise. Why, it's why God meets people on mountaintops. Moses, for example, in the Transfiguration. And our journey of life, when done well, follows this pattern. It is how we interact and understand the world. Since the cosmos has yet to be fully renewed, we get a glimpse of the end in the church. The church is this eschatological reality in the here and now. And this means that the kingdom of God, paradise renewed, is found within the church sacramentally. So the church itself can be understood as the mountain that we must ascend to reach paradise. And say Nikolai in the prologue connects this idea of each of us being an individual mountain. He goes so far as to say that all the saints are mountains. He quote, the Holy Church is the greatest mountain, and the right thy righteous, the saints and many are mountains. Basically we are small, that is as a man as our microcosm, we are the mini cosmos. If reality is structured as such, we are that as well. We are to be, we are essentially little mountains, and the church's goal is to go out into the world and to lead those to paradise. 
We all have this desire to reach the heights, just as Dante did. So I will read the last bit of the Paradiso, because it is wonderfully written. <clears throat> and this is how Dante has reached as far as he can. So this envision, I want you to keep in mind this as Dante is describing it. <clears throat> and I quote, From that moment, what I saw was greater than our language, which fails at such a prospect as memory fails at something so out of its way. As someone who sees something in his sleep and after his dream has only an impression of what he left and can recall nothing else. So am I, for my vision has almost gone, yet into my heart still drop by drop flows the sweetness which has born of it. So the snow loses its shape in the summer, so was it that the oracles of the Sibyl on the light leaves were lost in the wind. O supreme light, who rise far above, mortal notions lend my memory a little of what then appeared to me. And give my tongue all the power it needs so that a single spark of your glory may be transmitted to people in the future. For if something of it comes back to my mind, it sounds a little in these verses of mine, your triumph will more easily be conceived. I think that I should have been quite bewildered in the intensity of the living ray if my eyes had been turned away from it. And I remember that I was the bolder to bear the rays as long as my sight had intercourse with infinite power. Abundant grace, trust in whom I presumed to fix my gaze to the eternal light until I had seen all that I could see. I saw gathered there in the depths of it, bound up by love into a single volume, all the leaves scattered through the universe." Substance and accidents and the relations, but yet fused together in such a manner that what I am talking of is simple light. The universal form of this knot is what I think I saw, because when I say that, I feel that my gladness becomes more ample. A single moment costs me more forgetfulness than 25 centuries have the enterprise which made Neptune marvel at the sight of Argo. So my mind, held in complete suspense, gazed fixedly, motionless in intent, and always as if on fire with the gazing. In that light, a man becomes such that it is impossible he should turn away ever to look upon any other thing, because the good, which is the object of the will, is therefore in its entirety, and outside it there is some de defect in what there is perfect. My language now would be more inadequate even for what I remember than, than would that of a child still bathing his tongue at the breast. Not that there was more than a simple appearance in the light, in the living light which I gazed upon, and which is always as it always has been. It was my sight which was growing stronger as I was looking, so that looked like one worked on me as I myself changed. And the profundity of the clear substance of the deep light appeared to me three circles, of three colors, equal circumferences, equal circumference. And the first seemed to be reflected by the second as a rainbow by a rainbow, and the third seemed like a flame breathed equally by both. Oh, how my speech falls short, how faint it is for my conception, and for what I saw it is enough to say that I say little. O eternal light, existing in yourself alone, alone knowing yourself, and who known to yourself, and knowing love, and smile upon yourself. That circle which, conceived in this manner, appeared in you as a reflected light, and my eyes examined it rather more. <clears throat> Within itself, in its own color, seemed to be painted with our effigy, and so absorbed my attention altogether. Like a geometer who says himself, to square the circle and is unable to think of the formula he needs to solve the problem. So as I faced with this new vision, I wanted to see how the image could fit the circle and how it could be that it was where it was. But that was not a flight for my wings, except that my mind was struck by a flash in which it desired came to be. At this point, high imagination failed, but already my desire and my will were being turned like a wheel all at one speed by the love which moves the sun and the other stars. So in conclusion, this lecture was woefully inadequate at attempting to discuss 
Virgil, and Dante. And how we Orthodox Christians should read the crowning achievement of the high Middle Ages of Western Europe, the Divine Comedy. The next week, we'll ease off the intensity a little bit of some of the topics, and we'll discuss something a little bit more fun as we close out this series. We'll talk about mythical beasts, like dragons and griffins and whatnot, folk tales, and hagiography. Thank you.